right, hello, and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today, I am delighted to welcome from the Rocky Mountains, Denver, Colorado, Violet Rainwater. <laughs> How are you doing, Violet? Thank you so much for having me. I'm doing fantastic. Yeah, and Violet's on a mission to debunk old sales methodologies while teaching a fun and innovative approach to moving the needle in the corporate landscape. Recently featured in Forbes, uh, Violet has brought her signature framework to companies all over the country while teaching leaders and salespeople how they themselves can face the future with great efficiency and ease. And uh, what we're going to talk about today is mental health and sales uh, as we walk into a market correction and and let's face it violet there isn't there's probably no other group in an or, in an organization like sales people because they're the you know they're the tip of the spear they have got variable income mostly some of them have a lot of variable income so they have a lot of risk and they're the first ones who are going to meet a recession or market correction because they're the first ones who are going to encounter people saying sorry or i need to cancel that or you know budgets have been taken away so there's a huge amount of of stress and they're 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 the first ones they're really the canary in the coal mines absolutely the biggest challenge during a recession is for sales professionals because they're commission based i was on 100 percent commission when the market crashed in 08 and i was not given any awareness tools resources like it was just basically here you go figure it out for yourself and so yes what we're going to see is although a recession affects people all across where you're going to see the biggest hit. And that's why it's so important to focus on mental health with sales professionals is your sales force. And without a sales force, there's no business. So, you know, definitely pays to pay attention here and bring those resources so that you can stay in business. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and, the, and the thing is, when everybody gets a little bit uptight, when the market starts to change in businesses, so the stress levels go up and the pressure that's heaped onto sales is enormous. And so how would you talk to both the organize, organizations like sales leaders and managers and salespeople themselves, how to sort of make sure that the pressure is the appropriate level of pressure, but we're not like, really crushing people who who it may have long-term effects on. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's so important. And I, I believe that it needs to start with awareness. You know, mm -hmm. what happens to financial or to, to sales professionals financially in a down market is their financial security is no longer there, right? And Abraham Maslow, the father of human motivation explained mm -hmm. that that is a basic human need. And so what you're finding in today's workplace is a ton of people that are operating in survival mode. In fact, the latest statistic was that 70% of the workforce is operating from survival mode. And I would bet that it's actually even higher because like for myself, I ran in survival mode. I ran mm. on anxiety night and day when I was a financial advisor, but I didn't have an awareness to anything different. And so had people asked me, I thought that that was just normal. I didn't realize <laughs> that there was another way of being. And so I always say it must start with education. We must empower your sales team with an understanding of what's happening within them. So what's happening when they go into the survival mode, fight or flight, and how that affects their nervous system because it gets dysregulated and how that affects their thinking, their feeling, their being, the risks they're able to take, the opportunities that they see or unable to see, everything is attached to it. So when you're in survival mode, it doesn't matter how many hours you put in, you're not going to get the results that you want. So we must start by educating them what that looks like in their body and why that's detrimental to their health and their success. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because let's face it, when you're in survival mode, the first thing that looks like safety, you're going to jump into. I mean, it's a natural human instinct. The other thing, though, is uh, let's face it. I mean, we do celebrate stress and anxiety here we sometimes we've worn it as a badge of honor and we've all been guilty of it you know we all love to tell our war stories about oh i yes. work for six months seven days a week 24 hours a day and all of this kind of stuff 
But I mean, it, it, there's when in a situation like this, when the anxiety and the stress and the pressure really starts to ratchet up, it has a it has a negative. It starts to have a real negative effect. And I think that's when that's when people, as you said, both their mind and body, because they're connected, start to or start to become impacted. And if if your brain's overloaded, then it starts to manifest physically. It does. Absolutely. And, you know, this is where I love to bring in neuroscience and the power Mm -hmm. of neuroplasticity. I know for myself that I was programmed to not thrive during adversity and change. I would literally shut down. So you have the fight, the flight, the freeze, and now there's a fawn. And that's literally what happens anytime we're in survival mode. And so I didn't even have this awareness to what was going on. And so that's why I think, you know, to the second point of it is we have to provide after awareness, we have to provide the tools to help them come back to their Mm -hmm. self, right? To regulate their nervous system. And what I teach, what I feel is the foundation. It's not like, yeah, you could, or you should, you must. It's a morning routine. It's setting, starting the day and setting your nervous system, setting your programming to success versus let's just see what happens and, you know, allow autopilot to take over where we're not even aware that our autopilot sets us up for disaster. And so having these uh, this uh, tools that really tap into the power of neuroplasticity, which is the ability to change our programming, how we respond to stress. So for example, if we respond to stress, we shut down like I used to by incorporating a morning practice that incorporates maybe meditation, yoga, you know, to each person, it's something different. I always say, pick three or four ways that you want to feel in the day ahead and then incorporate those practices. So for me, I always start with meditation because after struggling with anxiety my entire life, nothing is more important than my peaceful state of being. But then it's also for me about hydration and movement and strength training so I can feel strong in my body because when I feel strong in my body, I feel strong in my mind. And then I have the courage to get out there as my highest self, as opposed to my five-year-old self, which is what happens when we're operating from survival mode. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's fascinating. And and let's face it, when you're under pressure like that as a, as a salesperson, you're probably having difficulty sleeping, you're stressed. So then when you wake up in the morning, you're probably rolling over, grabbing your phone, seeing, oh, did they reply to me? Uh, yeah, it's a no. I mean, uh, and now you're, you're just set up, uh, you're set up for, for a disastrous day because you're already like discombobulated. And then you probably turn to social media and see, oh, look, Violet looks like she's doing fantastic and I'm doing yes. even so now you're even now you're even in a worse condition. So to your point, how you start your day and the inputs are so incredibly important. Yeah, how we start our day, I always like to say is how our day continues, you know, but that's only one aspect of it. I think mm-hmm. the other part is really having an awareness to the things that trigger us in the, our work day. And I'll, I'll give you an example. When I was a financial advisor, one of my triggers that I did not have an awareness to were chargebacks. And a chargeback, essentially the way that it works is a client comes in, you present, you do all the things and they move forward and you do all the paperwork. You're already counting the money in your head. You're so excited, Mm -hmm. you know, and then the next day, maybe they talk to their friend, the trash man, who knows, but they've changed their mind. And so whenever that would happen, because I grew up in poverty and my relationship with money, that was a big trigger for me. So just having an awareness of what triggers you and then having a comeback ritual. So when I was triggered, the way that I would respond is I would completely shut down for days. I was in such a state of fear because it wasn't just this sale. What happens when we're triggered is all the past comes up, right? So for me, it was like, oh my God, I'm not going to have enough money and I'm going to end up on the streets, right? So it seemed that big. It was like a tidal wave that I couldn't think myself out of. But once I was able to recognize it and then come up with a comeback ritual, because I understood, oh, my nervous system is dysregulated. 
I need to take a few minutes and regulate my nervous system. And then I can think my way out of this, right? But not when I'm in a place of fear. So I would say education. So awareness, increasing the level mm -hmm. of awareness of what that stress does to our bodies, our minds, and our ability to think and feel and respond. And then having a morning ritual and then a comeback ritual. Those are my three things for getting through any type of market correction and not just surviving, but thriving. Because the yeah. reality is there is opportunity in every market. You know, We just have to shift how we're doing business today. But if we're in survival mode, we're not gonna be able to spot that opportunity. No, absolutely. And and I think the other part then, then because we feel pressure to have this bulletproof facade, especially because, as I said, like salespeople being on the being the tip of the spear, um, you know, therefore it and especially when market conditions are difficult, it, it's difficult for people to open up or even to sort of go, yeah, you know, I am I am kind of stressed. I do need some more help, whatever, because they feel like they don't want to they don't want to put their hand or put their head above the <laughs> above the paraffin and be the first one to go, oh, look, I need help. And then people think, oh, well, you know, we, we can't rely on you. <laughs> right. Right. Well, there's that negative stigma, right, that if we mm. uh basically focus or bring up our weaknesses. That's what it looks like. It looks like a weakness when in reality, it's just us being vulnerable. And mm -hmm. we already know the power of vulnerability, you know, that only leads to good things. But part of it is breaking the stigma that it's um, a negative thing, because this is something that every human being deals with, especially in adversity and change. And as we discussed earlier, you know, these younger generations that have never been through a market career direction they're going to need tools to get through this because they've only experienced the workplace in up times and it's an entirely mm -hmm. different workplace when we have a correction or a recession as us gen xers and baby boomers know because we've been through it a few times and so that's why i think this is so important what i teach is the things i was never given during the correction mm. of 08. I remember my uh, organization brought in a motivational speaker <laughs> and I was so excited. I thought, okay, he's gonna give me the three step, five step, 10 step, I don't care, just tell me what to do to get from here, broke and unable to close any business to you know here, prof prosper pro uh, prosperous and abundant. And his whole message to us was just be positive. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it was like, okay, I'm getting foreclosure letters. I'm a single mom and I, ha I don't even have enough in my bank account to feed my kid a happy meal, but you're telling me to just be positive. How mm. about, hey, Violet, here's what's happening. Here is what's really yeah. happening with uh, your day to day. You are being very triggered. And when you're triggered, your nervous system gets disre just regulated. And here's what it feels like. Because then I'd be like, yes, yes, that is what it feels like. So that's the problem. Here's the cause, right? Your cause for me specifically, it's our programming. It's how we were programmed. It's what we experienced as children growing mm -hmm. up. So if we had a lot of stress and adversity. Then the stress and adversity today is going to affect us that much more. Right. And yeah. then provide solutions. Here's what I want you to do for the next 30 days. I want you to come up with a morning ritual that allows you to come back to your peace and your power. Do these three things for 30 days and come back and tell me how you feel. That would have changed everything for me, but I didn't have the awareness and I didn't have the tools and all I had was just be positive. Yeah, and I love what you said there about uh, coming back to your peace and power. So, because I think that's a really key part that, that that's two parts to it, right? So it's not just coming back to peace. It's not just like relaxing and getting, right. you know, all all uh, all centered again. Bend out. It's yeah, yeah, exactly. And to where you're like, oh, maybe I'll just take the morning off. Yeah. Um, to it's the part to you're going there so that you can you can uh, unleash your power again. Because yeah. when you're a friend, and, and the thing is, we often again we we confuse power with activity and like you know moving fast and running around, jump all of that kind of stuff. Whereas, you know, it's it's the quiet, silent power that really yeah. wins at the end of the day. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I often say that it's that 
quiet uh, courage. It's that quiet knowing, which is something I didn't have or nobody has when we're mm -hmm. triggered and we're operating from a place of survival mode. It's really being able to access the highest faculties of our mind. And we don't have access to those when we are in fight or flight mode. And that's why coming back to our peace is the first step. That is our portal to our highest operating self. Because until we can regulate our nervous system and calm our minds and our monkey minds and our racing heart, we're not even going to be able to connect to higher thoughts that will allow us to think our way out of what's in front of us. Because the reality is, is the whole workplace is shifting. So if we did business this way, this is no longer mm -hmm. working. And so what the recession offers is an opportunity to sharpen our skill set, learn some new resources, technology, in order to help us really rise above the noise. It's actually a lot easier to be successful in a down market with the right tools because there's not as much competition because most people are shut down and in fear. It's just you, when you come back to your peace and then you can from there connect to your power, to your point, that, that quiet power, well, then you can spot opportunity even if it's 10 miles away, right? And yeah. you have the courage to take the risks that you need that is required whenever you grow. You cannot grow without taking risks and falling. But if you're already in a state of panic and fight or flight, any type of thought of risk isn't even going to enter your mind. You're going to be terrified. You're going to be literally like, you know, shut down mm. in a ball or lashing out and angry. And when you're in that state of mind, you're, you're not connected to your most creative essence. Yeah, absolutely. And the, and the other part, too, I think is, is that um, you can't wait around for people to fix stuff for you. And it's like, it's great if we all worked in, if everybody worked in organizations where the company was, oh, yes, okay, we need to give you this and we need to train you on that. But you have to invest in yourself and you live in a time and we live in a time where there is so much free stuff out there that you can invest yeah. in yourself or you can go to people like you and uh, there's so much help out there. Um, but you got to you got to invest in yourself rather than s sit and wait. And I often feel like people sit and wait and they go, well, my company's done nothing. Oh, they've done nothing for me. And you're thinking, <laughs> well, do it for yourself, dude. Come yeah. on. Yeah. I mean, we didn't have the power of the internet the way yeah. that we do back in 2008. So I didn't, I really didn't have mm. the resources that we have today. So to your point, yes, I do believe that. However, uh, one of the things that I talk a lot about is the future of business. And I do believe mm. 50 years from now, all organizations will make this top priority because they'll understand mm. that it is it has the closest connection to operating at higher levels. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to drive efficiency. Everyone wants to drive sales and move the needle. But yet we've been focused on these resources outside of ourselves. The future of business looks like unleashing our resources within us and organizations bringing in. Because think about how many times salespeople are taken out of the field for mandatory meetings that add mm -hmm. absolutely no value. I can't tell yeah. you how many times I had to sit in those meetings where you know, maybe I, there was product dumping on me, like features and benefits, you know, but that's not going to really help me move the needle in mm -hmm. this market. So I, to your point, yes, with all the resources we have, you can help yourself. But I do believe because we spend so much time in, in our workday in these organizations, that it is the organization's responsibility to bring that in. If they're spending all this money and bringing in speakers on you know, diversity and inclusion, all of the things that are important, then they definitely should bring in uh, resources to help us come back to ourselves and educate us on the devastating effects of running on, you know, survive yeah. in survival mode. Yeah. And, and just, and one other thing too, and I think this is a mistake that a lot of organizations make too, is, is that when a down market comes around or a recession or whatever, um, and you've been through good times, salespeople often forget fundamentals. It's, it's, it's human nature when things are going well, you know, we, we sort of maybe skip the first couple of steps. We don't need that because, you know, budgets are plentiful and it's quite easy. And then, and then the recession hits. I was running a sales, uh, con uh, global sales consulting company, Hathwaite, um, at the last, uh, the financial crisis. And one of the things that, you know, global sales leaders would some sometimes say to me, they'd say, oh, you know, my sales team is fantastic. And now it's like, it seems like they can't sell. And I said, well, were they fantastic or were they literally operating in a good market? I mean, so, and he said, what do you mean? And I'd say, well, have you looked at how they were selling? 
uh, and where they follow in processes, are they doing everything properly? If they start to do everything properly, I guarantee you'll see an uptick. Um, so I think that's also important for organizations to understand is just don't leave your salespeople on their own when it comes to when it comes into a recession go do some refreshers do some sales update your sales training you know work with people like yourself but just don't assume that they have as you said the tools for this market yeah absolutely i mean i remember my leaders they were you know hiding under the table themselves like they'd never yeah. seen a correction like that you know mm -hmm. i'm imagine being in the financial service industry in 08 when you know mm -hmm. enron and then all these big organizations started going under i remember the bank across the street from us shut its doors and i could see people lined up just like the depression you know so yeah. for me i had i had walked in at the crash of 01 but i didn't have any clients like so for me it was just uphill i had my best year ever my rookie year during the worst dot com crash ever but in 08 that was an entirely different story and you know to your point about giving them the tools to really innovate their sales systems that's so important today with technology, metrics, data, video communication, uh, so many AI, so many different yeah, tools yeah. that we didn't have. Like when I started selling, I had a pager and I knew where every working <laughs> payphone uh, was in my territory, which is San Diego, where you are now, because that was how I did business back then. Now, if we look at that today, that seems so inefficient. Well, there's a lot of people still selling without incorporating all these new tools that really are act as a sales enablement for sales professionals. So I really think it's both. I think it's this piece on mm -hmm. what's going on inside yeah. system wise, but then also what systems are we using in our sales process and how can we innovate that, whether it's social selling or, you know, incorporating video or, or looking at different types of tech technology to add to our current tech stack to really allow us to get some results. Because when you can figure out a way how to drive business in a down market, that is going to be like the floodgate gates open, you know, and you're yeah. going to be extremely successful and thrive in this new modern workplace. Yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, uh, and I think, yeah, it's, it, there's great opportunity. There's great opportunity there for people, but yeah, the message to, to organizations and to, to leadership is, Hey, we all know how hard it is to find good salespeople, right? If there was, if I had a dollar for every time somebody told me how hard it is to recruit, recruit good salespeople, I would have retired by now. Um, so What's the alternative is like, look after your people that you yeah. have, the good people that you have. Don't let them burn out. Don't leave them struggling. Don't don't focus in on yourself about, yeah, it's tough for you, too. But you have responsibility for other people. And at the end of the day, if you're a leader or a sales manager, or whatever, at the end of the day, it's your salespeople who are going to make you successful. That's right. You got to lead them to higher ground. They're looking at you. You're the leader. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. John. Yeah. Yeah, so get out from under your desk. Uh, <laughs> all right, well, <laughs> listen, all of Violet's information is going to be below this video, but before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and your company. Yeah, absolutely. So I am the founder of the Rainmakers Way. I'm a sales architect and I build sales systems for organizations to really help them innovate so they can dominate. Um, so we specialize in service-based professionals, so financial advisors, real estate agents, ba bankers, mortgage brokers, and you know a lot of those are really struggling right now. So if you're looking for a way to really help your team rise above the noise and innovate in order to dominate, then I would love to get on a call and chat on ways that we can really help them move the needle in this new modern workplace. Yeah, no, absolutely. And if you go back and look at history, you'll find the companies that really succeeded during downtimes and came out the strongest were the ones who paid attention to things like this and invested rather than just, and let's face it, if you take training, performance improvement, innovation, you, all of those look really, really tempting to just slash off your budget. Um, yes. But the companies, the companies that don't do that are the ones who actually succeed. Yeah, well, so, it's like Steve Jobs explained yeah. that the way that you can differentiate between a leader and a follower, innovation. So, yeah, to your point. Absolutely. All right. Well, listen, thanks again, Violet. Uh, thank you for watching and listening. And I will see you all again very soon. Thank you. Thank you so much.